Before we start talking about VAC and hyperbaric, let's look at some of the basic science and animal data behind uh, hyperbaric. Uh, Jack, can you talk about these studies real quickly? Sure. Uh, uh, Bob Marks back in 1990 showed uh, in, a, in a radiated uh, rabbit mandible model a significantly increased vascularity uh, in animals that were treated with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And then Gibson showed in mice uh, uh, implanted with metrogel plugs uh, also showed increased angiogenesis with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Absolutely. Uh, Nylander in uh, 84 published a study looking at, uh, again, another animal model. It was just this time rats. And we created a hind limb ischemia, and then he looked at edema formation uh, as one of his markers. He found a marked reduction in edema uh, with uh, the rats that were treated with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. He also observed um, that um, this uh, was thought to be related to ATP, uh, ATP preservation uh, and allowing cells to control their osmolality. And they actually looked at AP, ATP uh, in samples of dry tissue. And here you see uh, the samples showing that there was a nice preservation uh, in the animals treated with hyperbaric, uh, both uh, on a daily as well as a twice a day uh, treatment schedule. And in fact, in the animals that were treated, BID had uh, markedly increased preservation of a ATP. Another area of uh, fairly significant uh, data and, and recent study has been in the uh, area of ischemia reperfusion. A number of authors, including uh, Zamboni and Burris, have looked at the fact that HbO2 uh, treated patients uh, and cell cultures in vitro models have shown marked decrease in white cell adherence uh, following ischemic sort of uh, situations. Just wanted to share with you the experimental design of uh, John and Wendy's uh, model. Here briefly is uh, John and Wendy's uh, experimental design. They cultured human umbilical vein endothelial cells. They then simulated an ischemia reperfusion injury by exposing these cell lines to hypoxia, hypoglycemia for four hours. They then treated one of the cell lines with hyperbaric and then placed them in a normoxic and normal glycemic environment. They then studied these cells and found that there was a marked reduction in VCAM1 expression in the cell line that was treated with a hyperbaric oxygen therapy as opposed to the cell line that was not treated with hyperbaric. And in fact, the cell line that was treated with hyperbaric basically had no increase in VCAM1 expression uh, compared to controls. In addition, they looked at um, growth factor expression, uh, platelet-derived growth factor and uh, epidermal growth factor and they looked at human dermal fibroblasts. And again, what you can see here is versus control, the group treated with hyperbaric had a marked increase in growth factor expression. And finally, they looked at proliferation of these uh, fibroblasts. And then these fibroblasts were taken from human uh, donors. They then treated one cell line with hyperbaric and had a marked increase uh, in proliferation of these fibroblasts versus control. Shifting gears and looking at some of the human data that supports the use of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, this is a paper that I published in 1997 following my fellowship. We created uh, a burn model in human volunteers. The way we uh, accomplished that is we offered uh, enlisted folks in the military a day or two off, and they kindly extended their forearms to allow us to create this burn model. But in a very painless fashion, we raised a suction, suction blister, then excised the dermis. Uh, once we had exposure of the subdermis, we then irradiated that tissue with UV light. We then blinded uh, the treatments of these uh, groups. We divided the patients into a control group. They were treated at 8.5, 7% oxygen at 2.4 atmospheres. And the hyperbaric group was obviously treated with 100% oxygen. We then looked at a number of wound healing parameters. Here you see our data looking at wound hyperemia or edema formation, marked decrease in edema formation in the hyperbaric treated group on day two. Looked at wound measurements, there was also statistically significant decrease in wound size on a day two with the hyperbaric treated group. And here's the amount of exudate. You can see very nice difference in uh, the hyperbaric group versus control uh, at multiple days in the study. Here are our outcome data. You can see we reached statistically significant difference in wound size, hyperemia, and exudation. Uh, and uh, we did see a trend uh, towards improvement epithelization, but did not reach uh, statistical significance. Jack, there's some data looking at diabetic foot patients right. in the literature. This is one of the earlier studies uh, by Baroni, um, and this was non-randomized, but I believe he used historical controls, looked at eight patients treated with hyperbarics, and 10 uh, controls uh, 
that did not receive hyperbaric oxygen therapy and showed uh, statistically significant improvement in those that uh, in, in, ter in terms of the number that healed, uh, 16 of 18 hyperbaric oxygen therapy treated patients healed, whereas only one out of the 10 control patients healed. And Fagali had some very, very nice right. work that was recently posted. Now this, this uh, paper is probably what uh, Medicare based their decision on, at least one of the parameters that the Medicare based their decision on a reimbursement right. for diabetic foot disease. It's a, a widely quoted article. Um, this was a, a prospective randomized a trial of, of 70 patients using hyperbaric oxygen therapy. In this comparison, three of the 35 patients uh, in the treated group were amputated. That was 8.6% versus a much higher number, 33% or 11 of 33 patients who did not receive hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And, and again, that, uh, that study did show statistical significance.